British people have spoken, and the answer is, we're out. Cast your eye back to that heady summer of 2016, the Brexit campaign and the fallout from it. Politics had never looked more brutal, and we were all slack-jawed watching some of the most powerful figures in the country knock the stuffing out of each other. Amidst the carnage, one particularly major casualty. Just a year after his election, the Prime Minister had been felled. But for another of Britain's most powerful people, a man whose face you'll rarely see, Brexit marked the ultimate victory. Paul Dacre shuns the limelight, but every day his message is received by millions. For 25 years, he's been the editor of the Daily Mail, the voice of Middle England. In the run-up to the 2015 general election, his newspaper had savaged the Labour Party and championed Mr Cameron. But on Brexit, it had been Mr Cameron who'd been on the receiving end of a relentless Daily Mail assault. With the result in the balance, the Daily Mail had nailed its colours to the mast and won the sweetest of victories. Looking at the coverage of the time, you could be forgiven for wondering if it was about more than just Dacre's long-standing dislike of the EU, if it wasn't tinged by something rather personal. Well, now I can reveal an intriguing subplot to that whole Brexit campaign that might help explain the pretty brutal treatment of a Prime Minister he had so recently helped to get elected. I've learned that early in the campaign, Paul Dacre heard something guaranteed to make any editor see red. He'd been told the Prime Minister was trying to get him sacked. This is the story of a very personal standoff between two of the country's most powerful men. It's a story of how the preeminent figure in British journalism went to war with the Prime Minister and won. This is where it all began almost exactly a year ago. David Cameron had a deal on Europe, one he hoped he could take to the country to persuade us to stay in the EU. He recognises a stumbling block, and that is Paul Dacre, a man he needs to have on side. Dacre's invited to the private flat in Downing Street, the Cameron's home. From what I understand, the two chat amicably within the early evening chaos of a family setting. The kids are still up, the TV's on, the two men share a glass of wine and the Prime Minister asks his guest if he'll cut him some slack, just pull back a bit from some of the intense Euroscepticism. The response from Mr Dacre is, I'm told, swift and uncompromising. He can't change his position on such a core principle, one he has held for some 25 years. His readers, too, viscerally Eurosceptic. He owes it to them to show backbone. Then, I'm told, he points to the television, showing pictures of migrants arriving in southern Europe. Those are the pictures that will decide the outcome of the referendum, the Prime Minister is told. Over the coming weeks, Dacre sticks to his line, but not everyone at the paper is pro-Brexit. Lord Rothermere, who owns the Daily Mail, is a known Remainer. It will be Rothermere who Cameron approaches next. In March, Dacre learns something that leaves him incandescent. He's told the Prime Minister approached Viscount Rothermere with a view to having Dacre removed from his job. Is it conceivable that David Cameron would have requested Paul Dacre be removed from his post by his proprietor? It's certainly consistent with what I know to be the case about the attitude at the very apex of the Cameron government about Dacre. Um, a member of the Cameron government told me very recently that there could be no revival in centrism in this country as long as Paul Dacre was editor of the Mail. And that was presented to me as, as an absolute precondition of any advance of the centre-right or centre-left, which is a striking thing to say. So you're operating here in a context where one individual, one editor, is regarded as being of supreme importance in their political universe, as if the Daily Mail is a kind of planet which exercises a huge gravitational pull over the whole of the print media. A spokesman from Lord Rothermere's office refused to confirm or deny Newsnight's story, but added, over the years, Lord Rothermere has been lent on by more than one Prime Minister to remove associated newspapers' editors, but, as he told Lord Justice Leveson on oath, he does not interfere with the editorial policies of his papers. 
The relationship between David Cameron and Paul Dacre has never been a simple one. Back in 2005, Tory hopefuls lined up to lead the party. Paul Dacre originally backed Ken Clark, an arch-Europhile. But as Cameron's popularity grew, he attracted the male's backing, even though politically the two men were often at odds. Of course, there's always a honeymoon when uh, a leader comes in who has the makings of a potential prime minister. But Cameron in 2005 hit the ground running with his modernisation agenda, which was green, it was about recycling, it was about gay rights, it was about being nice to hoodies. It was almost as if he had drawn up a list of things that the male hates. And so obviously there was an ideological gap between the male and the Conservative Party at that point. And then there was Andy Coulson, a Murdoch old hand who David Cameron wanted to bring into the heart of his team. Dacre warned him not to, Cameron ignored him. Coulson would eventually be jailed for phone hacking. When Dacre found himself dragged in front of the Leveson inquiry, he felt a palpable sense of grievance. Am I alone in detecting the rank smells of hypocrisy and revenge in the political class's current moral indignation over a British press that dared to, expect, to expose their greed and corruption? The same political class, incidentally, that until a few weeks ago had spent years indulging in sickening genuflections of the Murdoch press. For a year after Leveson, I'm told Dacre to refused to take Cameron's phone calls. By now, in other words, there were plenty of reasons for Dacre to dislike Cameron. Politically, the two were at odds. Personally, they'd fallen out. But would David Cameron, a sitting PM, who'd vowed to the papers to preserve their press freedom, really seek to oust an editor? I asked David Cameron if he tried to have Dacre removed. This is what we got. It is wrong to suggest that David Cameron believed he could determine who edits the Daily Mail. Remember, that's not actually the question we asked. His spokesman then went on. It is a matter of public record that he made the case that it was wrong for newspapers to argue that we give up our membership of the EU, particularly when they had not made the case before. This appears to refer to the Mail's former support for ardent European Ken Clark. His statement finishes by confirming those two meetings. He made this argument privately to the editor of the Daily Mail, Paul Dacre, and its proprietor, Lord Rothermere. From Paul Dacre's office, simply this. For 25 years I have been given the freedom to edit the Mail on behalf of its readers without interference from Jonathan Rothermere or his father. It has been a great joy and privilege. June the 24th brings a new political dawn and a Cameron resignation. Shortly afterwards, Dacre's told by Rothermere something he's known privately for months, that David Cameron wished him gone. But the big question remains. Was the Mail's coverage, or even the final Brexit result, influenced by a very personal feud at its heart? But what we can say unequivocally was that the most um, brash and noisy and confident newspaper in the country was stridently anti-EU and, and increasingly bitter and hostile towards Cameron. So uh, alleging causality is, is impossible uh, without, without access to the mind of every voter. But the, 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 the basic evidence is that this was a very important engine of the result. So how should we read this? A newspaper editor who wielded too much power or an elected PM seeking to make his mark on the free press. And Dacre v Cameron, Dacre won. Absolutely. <laughs>